right, well, thank you very much for joining us for our last panel of the day. It's been a heck of a day. We've had terrific conversations all day long. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And it's been a pleasure to have you. I found it like, like we've had such a wonderful audience. The questions, the quality of the questions from the previous panel. I mean, we could have run an entire conference just based on that. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you very much for your participation, for your keen attention and your terrific questions. I hope that you will give us exactly the same level uh, and the same quality of attention and questions uh, as part of this last panel that will be dedicated to digital identity, the intersection between digital identity and refi and uh, sustainable development might not be obvious at first, but don't worry, we'll talk about it at length on why digital identity is such a key factor in achieving sustainable development goals. And to really explore that intersection, uh, I will be. I have the pleasure to be to be joined with, by Evan, who's the co-founder of Disco.xyz. I mean, it's pretty sex, self-explanatory. Perrine Cotelogon, uh, who is the French national contact point of the EPSI. The EPSI is the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure, and also a blockchain expert at Université de Lille. And Duke, who uh, accepted to join us on the very, very last minute. Thank you very much for being with us, Duke, uh, who's the co-founder of Sovereign Technologies and Identiki. You can give a round of applause for our speakers. <laughs> and without further ado, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, same thing as the previous panel, I ask you a question that is just setting the stage a bit. Right. So for the ones of you that are interested in data and numbers, uh, according to the latest, latest research and studies, there are roughly 850 million individuals today on Earth that still do not have access to an official ID, let alone a digital one. Right. Uh, and another uh, trend, uh, another data point that I want you to have in mind for this conversation is that nearly, according to the UNHCR, so the United Nations High, Committee, uh, High Commissioner uh, for Refugees, more than 110 million human beings have been forcibly displaced from, them, from, from their home due to conflicts, to political pressure, and to climate disasters. Fleeing your country uh, is also uh, exposing you to uh, losing your identity, right? Because you're, uh, you're losing an administrative system that might, be, that might be failing in terms of, in case of a political conflict. And you might arrive to, a, to another place in which your national identity might not be recognized at all. So in this quite bleak landscape in which we take identity as granted, but it is definitely not. Can blockchain bring a change and help human beings access a consistent identity in a safe and resilient manner? I see, I, I see your eyes are sparkling, so, so Evan, please go ahead and jump for this first question. Thank you so much, and, and thank you to our gracious hosts for, for having us today, and I appreciate every single one of you for, uh, for hanging out on this warm summer afternoon to discuss what I think you know, is, is one of the most compelling ideas um, you know, that, that we have the opportunity to, to review this week. Um, my name's Evan, I work with the team at Disco, and um, you know, when we talk about the ability to have access to an identity, I think sort of for the theme of today, it might be valuable for us to start by you know, defining or kind of setting the grounds for what is self-sovereign identity? What is this identity thing that we're talking about? Um, so at Disco, we describe self-sovereign identity as an identity system in which the subject of data has the most control over that data. Not ultimate control, not just dictatorial control, ability to modify, et cetera, but more control than other parties. 
So it makes sense that because you are the world's expert in being you, you have had your identity since the day you were born, uh, it would be pretty strange if someone else knew more about your identity than you do, which is pretty much the case right now with how your data is handled in a traditional Web2 environment. So if we are to empower uh, individuals around the globe who do not yet have formal identity systems using decentralized technologies, we need to first start with the requirements. What, what makes an identity? What will allow for this representation of self to be flexible enough to move with an individual from one place to another, to be able to interoperate in the places where identities are required, public and private, uh, and where consent, informed participatory consent, can be at the core. Now, this is almost at odds with the idea of a blockchain. Uh, data on-chain is public and immutable, intended to be transferable. Your identity is not public and permanent and available for sale. You are not obligated to be the same person you were 30 seconds ago, and uh, certainly not obligated to embody every trait you've ever had. That's why you do not apply to jobs today with your 2008 MySpace profile. So blockchains, which are public and permanent and require us to embody all of the traits that we express with our wallets in perpetuity, are actually, can, can actually be a dangerous place for us to put identity. Um, we have many historical examples where publicly exposing ethnic minorities can lead to harm and to violence. And so a public ledger is not an appropriate place to disclose traits that can be used to marginalize or harm us, such as our gender or our ethnicity. However, the key pairs that we get from a chain afford us the ability to self-custody information, to indeed be in the most control over that data, and to elect to selectively disclose that which is relevant and important. So to sort of a long answer to your short question, the, an the solution that I see, de de decentralized technologies like, like blockchain enabling for those who do not yet have recognized formal interoperable identities, is that keys, of, keys will allow us to secure those identities. But the data that describes you, that you can compel to represent your identity, should not live on chain in a form that can be consumed by anyone on Earth and in space with an internet connection for all time. It must be able to change and evolve like we do because we are human. The traits of data that we carry with us must be resolvable back to their author such that no intermediary is the source of our personhood. No centralized authority can decide that we no longer may have a valid identity. Wow, this was really clear, I think. And now this is a complete different vision of self-sovereign identity. So in 2018, there was an initiative from the 27 state members uh, of the European Union and the European Commission who decided together to sign a document which is called a partnership, and it was called the European Blockchain Partnership. And the idea was to develop a pan-European vision of what the te blockchain technology could uh, be, uh, how to take it, be curious, stay open, and uh, therefore, they decided to also develop an infrastructure, which is, I think, a really a cool way to discover things. Um, and uh, after the state member had voted, uh, so the first, very first use cases were the self-sovereign identity, which is really interesting because, of course, if you develop a, not only a, an infrastructure but a e EU ID wallet. <laughs> plus uh, some first use case, you are really, uh, it, you make it possible to adopt the rules, you know, and the, the, the law uh, applicable directly to 450 million people <laughs> and uh, to uh, certify that those data will be, will be in charge of our own data within this European uh, wallet. So the, uh, the global idea is that uh, there is a, like Google Pay has become a Google Wallet, <laughs> or Apple Wallet, uh, we'll have an EU DI Wallet that will allow us to have uh, our train tickets, uh, or, and this is new, our diplomas, uh, in, uh, in our use case. Yes, I come from a university, University of Lille in the north of France, and, but I was uh, funded by the Ministry for National Education uh, in, at the same time. Uh, so I, 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 we came from all around Europe saying there is something to do 
about uh, education and the blockchain. Uh, and, and people had been working already for 20 years on verifiable credentials and peer-to-peer -peer recognition of students, of people, about their competencies. It's called now open recognition. And so there is not only the diploma use case, but there are many other things to recognize in people and that you will be able to find in that wallet thanks to the adoption at that level of a common standard that, is, that will be crypto. So for all these reasons, I am very happy to tell you that we have already sent to our students within the University of Lille, or should I say the alumni, uh, 50,000 uh, diploma. <laughs> Uh, digital certificate stamped in the Avalanche blockchain for the time being because the European uh, blockchain service infrastructure is not done. And they have been already verified uh, more than 70,000 times in 145 countries. So you see this use case is really good for young people, for their mobility, for employers to verify uh, if they really have the diploma. This is a first step. And I am uh, uh, so the project uh, manager of the on the French uh, side of the pan-European mega project uh, called Vector, uh, and that is financed by the European uh, Digital Programme, which uh, which is the the way to 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 make land to make the the European strategy for the next decade land down to people to real people on various use cases. Mm. Yeah, um, so the last several years of working with uh, sovereign technologies and, and working to build these uh, systems for human freedom and uh, sovereignty um, has really lent a lot of perspective. There's a lot of unintended consequences to deploying some of these technologies without fully understanding what those consequences are going to be in society. And, um, uh, and I think there's been, it's, there's been a little bit of kind of groupthink uh, regarding the term blockchain, like because it has come to kind of be an accretion of these emotional values of you know, decentralization and, and you know, a censorship resistance and you know, things that we can really uh, get behind, like power you know, for the people. Um, uh, but for specific use cases, a, uh, a consensus-based uh, public ledger is not the best choice of a database. Um, and so the aspect of blockchain that is absolutely perfect for identity is the key pair. Um, so having a public and private key, you can self-attest. Uh, you don't have to ask permission. You can self-authenticate. Um, and, and this kind of inversion of control is what makes everything uh, possible that's kind of the roots of this revolution, really. And um, like just to, um, yeah, yeah, just to go um, even further with like uh, publishing credentials Default open, non repudiable, you can't take it back, uh, immutable, you can't change it. Um, there's specific social pressures that can arise, like when uh, it becomes ubiquitous. Um, oh, well, I have this, well, why, why don't you? And, and then uh, you can exclude uh, certain populations without that being the original intention of the system. Um, so, uh, yeah, but definitely having access to uh, sovereign technologies that we can utilize to um, self-attest about ourselves, about others, and then have the selective disclosure where we can reveal it to whom we want to know, when we want to reveal it. Um, uh, really, uh, and I think we're, we're in agreement on that, is um, the, the basis for a, a an open, self-sovereign, you know, identity system that can can really uh, be from the people, from the ground up, like, and not really um, having to be forced in a top-down fashion.
All right, well, thank you for this terrific introduction. If you didn't know what self-sovereign identity means and why it actually matters to be the owner of your own identity, of your um, identifiers as well, uh, I guess you all have a clearer picture of this. But, uh, and that's fun because I was saying that uh, I didn't include any question really tackling that and all of you uh, decided to, uh, to focus your answers on this. And you're right, that's probably what we need to start with. Uh, the, the next natural question that comes from all of your answers is that uh, if, if people need to be empowered by decentralized identity systems, to uh, truly own their own identity, and if that really unlocks so many use cases and so uh, such value, um, my my question would be: How do you make sure that in a decentralized setting, uh, people act, have an actual access to those technologies? Especially because uh, we've been used to delegate that identity management to states, public institutions, and now in the digital ec ecosystem to big tech companies, uh, so social network platforms that know everything about us and that we let them uh, log us in other services with only one click. So uh, in your mind, and I'm asking that because we were talking about people with no access to identity whatsoever, or migrants and refugees, so people with already uh, facing strong marginalization, hard access to uh, technology. How can we make decentralized identity truly accessible for, for everyone? Because it's also part of the EPSI mandate, right? Like the European mandate is to make it accessible for any citizen, whatever is your age. And yeah, this is well, and, and this also takes us to probably one of the themes that many of you have discussed this week. Can you raise your hand if you've heard the meme onboarding the next billion? All right, we see some hands. Raise your hand if you know where we're onboarding them. What are they going to do when they get there? right? Other than be our exit liquidity. So we need to think of a better reason to be bringing people into this party. When we think about the blockers that limit them, that prohibit people from coming to join us on the disco dance floor today, we look at the sort of range of reasons that people come to decentralized technologies. The two sets of extremes that bring us here, are bring people to this ecosystem, largely are those in dire need, whose keys are the difference between surviving and thriving and not. And those who have quite a lot of time and extra resources and, uh, you know, technical literacy and intellectual curiosity. So these are both extreme environments that do not represent the majority of individuals and certainly are, are you know, far from the experience every day that many in Web3 or decentralized technologies design for. So when we identify these marginalized communities, we think about people like refugees, we need to think about what devices do they have. Do they have access to consistent internet? Are you, they, they using desktop? Are they going to be able to plug in their ledger hardware wallet regularly? Probably not. And so contemplating the environment, the conditions of onboarding is one important element. What is the user experience design and recovery system for a key pair that you cannot rotate? So that's an important for us, thing for us to think about, and I think especially relevant as we discuss account abstraction, decoupling the identity and execution layers. The other aspect of usability and access that I think is important for us to remember is that humanity is not uniform. A blockchain is a trust-minimized, rational execution environment that is a feminist technology. Blockchains are feminist because they work the same for every run, regardless of your gender or identity expression. But we know that the world doesn't work like that. Every culture, every community, every nation is different. And an identity system that enables the flexibility of one phone per family in a place like India with Adhara would not work in a place like Lagos, where there is greater technical literacy and greater access to connectivity, even in um, you know, different parts of the city that may not be as developed. And so contemplating a system that is flexible to the cultures and communities in which it is adopted that requires a minimum level of technical literacy and development. So we need it to be accessible. It is 
unreasonable to expect that the entire world is going to onboard to MetaMask and feel confident from day zero managing their entire lives through that interface. In the same way that in the late 1870s, we had the, you know, telegraph had to learn Morse code. Nobody really wanted to learn that. In the 1980s, we have the IBM PC had to learn slash QZs. No one really wanted to learn that. But we ended up with the telephone. We ended up with the Macintosh. Today, we are asking people to learn a series of strange and complex incantations, key management, on-chain interaction. And those UX capabilities will be tolerated by those who can use their keys to survive but it's going to be scary. They will be exploited or enjoyed by those who have extra time and resources, such as ourselves. But in order to bring those two communities together, we need to design in a way that is optimized for human beings, not only for capital efficiency, liquidity providers, and making sure we can bet on the way up, bet on the way down, and get out of the Ponzi in time. Um, it's true that when I am so lucky to, to work for a pan-European project, so I think that a, a lot of people have a, a smartphone, at least in, in France. Uh, I saw the, the figures uh, yesterday, and it's quite impressive. It's like 87% of the population has a smartphone, and uh, some have 11, uh, 11 devices at their home, which is too much. <laughs> and uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, you have uh, all these civil service that disappear, where you have no nobody to speak to when you are illiterate. And uh, I think um, one should not forget that this, uh, di this digital identity is not only uh, for having it in the smartphone, but it's the way uh, today the administration deal with our data so it doesn't matter actually even in, in any in any um, mary or in every town uh, you have someone who register the birth you know uh, not the 800 uh, million uh, you were speaking of in the world but uh, most of uh, the developed country and the development country have uh, somewhere where you you not when you were born, you know. So I think uh, in the end it becomes a data, and this is all managed uh, by uh, this um, various uh, way to use our identity. If you go to an, uh, another country and use a passport, it's uh, it's still physical. It can be uh, digitized, but it's still physical. In the end, uh, people who are uh, far away from the digitization, they, they are also concerned by this self-sovereign identity concept so that uh, we don't misuse the identity. Uh, and, and secondly, uh, in migrant camps, um, there have already been a, a solution developed on the blockchain to re-give an identity to people because a lot of people have lost their identity and uh, you have to rebuild it uh, so practically from the declaration and uh, this is stamped in the blockchain too so that it can be used also in the food distribution so that no one is you know is um, uh, taking uh, too too, ma too much food uh, from another family uh, etc so there are various way uh, how blockchain can be used uh, even for people who are not uh, having any any smartphone or computers and just to finish the students <laughs> because i love to watch the statistics and see all the many countries where it was verified and they do have a lot of smartphones you know you can see the various uh, items they have uh, it's uh, very impressive uh, how many smartphones there are. The, it's it's uh, very often, uh, it's not the students actually, it's the employer too, they verify uh, through a smartphone. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so th there's a quote that I love. Um, the history of decentralized technologies is the history of defense against civil attacks. And um, if you don't know, that's uh, sort of like the sock puppet attack where one person um, assumes multiple uh, pseudo identities um, and and tries to game whatever whatever system is being set up um, and and so then there there are many ways to defend against these sorts of attacks and um, 
So, you know, and that has led us to a lot of the designs that we see in, in blockchains and other cryptographic systems now. Um, yeah, with, um, again, there's some solutions that are coming out that have sort of a little bit of a surveillance flavor to them, which is a bit concerning. Uh, it guards well against uh, civil attacks, but um, right, I, as a human being, uh, value privacy and I value flexibility of identity. Um, and so it's extremely important for me to be able to uh, create uh, the identities in a self-sovereign way. I want to be able to uh, speak my own identity into being, create my own key, and then uh, start to circulate that. There's another quote that I enjoy. It's a bit oversimplified, but it's, um, identity is what other people say about you. Now, I mean, it's also about what you say about yourself. Um, but there's something where when we all look at a point together and communicate about it, it starts to reify. There's a, there's a reality there. And when I am at a rave, when I am talking with gamers, when I'm talking with my uh, blockchain community, when I'm talking with my you know, old um, colleagues at Amazon, like, I'm not always the same person. Um, and I want that to remain possible. So how do we actually have people maintain a key pair when maybe they're not technically sophisticated. Not everyone is technically sophisticated. I've done two projects now where we've tried to onboard non-technical people into MetaMask, and it's terrifying for them. You can see them when they give that big warning, and they're like, I have to write down these words. What do I do with it? Like, so, and, and then actually the majority of people in the general public feel like getting into crypto means having a Coinbase account, which is the other end of the spectrum. And so where is the middle ground here? How do we have the ability to maintain self-sovereign key material without going into full custodianship and also without requiring grandmothers to be responsible for their own infosec? There is a design space with various trade-offs, and um, so one of the things we're working on is actually uh, trust-minimized account recoverability um, with like a, a federated uh, guardian system um, for, for that particular use case. But it's, it's, still, it's still an open question, and, and you know, it will take some iteration. I see you noting. Do you want to, to bounce back on that? Uh... Evan. Sure, yeah, you know, I absolutely agree with you that, um, you know, when we think of our, the way that we use applications today, right, when we ask the question, well, what's it going to take to onboard people to a decentralized technology managing a key pair in a way that is not horrible? Right? And I think, like, we can be, I'll be honest here, raise your hand if an interaction with a Web3 wallet has ever stressed you out, ever made you uncomfortable. Very cool. Okay, so this is not a good sign that this is the standard that we all experienced, willing to take time out of our day to come here to talk about this, feel uncomfortable. How outlandish it is that we hope to invite billions of people to join us in this discomfort, right? Projects get to ask for one miracle. Our one miracle should be that users are able to achieve their goal with our tool, not that they are you know, able to, to overcome the fear of the first screen. And that's sort of where we are right now. So in terms of technical solutions, it's giving biometrics, it's giving on-device hardware enclave, it's giving MPC and the ability to have, you know, trusted programmable key pairs that can allow us to, you know, abstract away the complexity of this technology. I think it's also important for us to remember that, you know, we are all, we're all kind of protocol fetishists here. We're really excited about talking about the protocols because that's the top layer of what's exposed. Now, fortunately, we have incredible leaders like my co-panelists here who can discuss with us more tangible examples. We at Disco you know, work on decentralized data, everything from Spotify to community memberships to KYC. Um, but for many of the use cases that we think about, they're pretty esoteric. They're pretty far away. 
um, the you know behaviors that we're asking people to participate in to onboard are are you know really difficult for a lot of people to grok. Um, and so the bare minimum is that the blockchain part is invisible. We don't talk about TCP IP or HTTPS when we use Zoom. We should not talk about the underlying protocol when we use an app. The reason that we talk about the protocol is that we have to excuse the poor experience of the app and talk about the speculative financial traits that it has in addition. Even, uh, sorry, even um, sending a large amount from a multi-sig as an expert and having to cross my fingers, please don't get lost, please don't get lost. Like, it's, yeah, no, it's, it's not a, um, it's not an ideal experience, and being able to have reified points of identity can just, even, even that, even just that one little thing where you know you're sending it to something that's actually there, and it's not going to be, oh, I, I missed one of the hexadecimal numbers. Um, you know, Pierre, that my true love is for open education and not particularly for blockchain technologies. And I always uh, really appreciate that um, blockchain technologies have brought a lot of people of every age and every origin to get interest into the informatic is history, into the finance, investment, uh, and, and uh, there are so many uh, fantastic uh, videos and texts to explain everything what is happening on blockchain. And within 10 years, I mean, the distributed syst system have developed. It's really a new informatic world we are going to. to. And uh, I don't know what bricks of the blockchain, of the tool of the idea will remain, but a lot. <laughs> and it's true, I don't think people will notice it. Because uh, the first example that was given to me is about a car. You can drive a car and use a car to go from one point to the other, and you don't know at all how it works. And it's the same uh, with uh, our devices. We don't know, well, maybe you do, but I don't know how it really works. But I have learned within the 10 last years, or let's say 15, to a uh, lot of new features, uh, of uh, new ways to use a smartphone, uh, to pay with a smartphone, etc. So I think in the end, uh, because blockchain is addressing uh, many different uh, uh, kind of uh, pro problems, like traceability or managing your private key and the, <laughs> and the blockchain, etc. I, th I think in the end, a uh, lot is going to change thanks to all this movement and people w won't notice it in the end and this is why I believe in this EU DI wallet and I think there is a uh, uh, Joseph Lubin told it to Grégory Raymond yeah, uh, who is the journalist covering uh, uh, the Ethereum conference uh, he said uh, he, the European regulator is very smart, you know? And it's true that what they're doing with this uh, European blockchain service infrastructure is really fine, and they're taking a lead on, on the crypto world, actually, uh, thinking of this EU DI wallet based on a, uh, on a distributed uh, system. It's uh, really interesting and to be followed up. Yeah, I want to uh, go back to what Duke said about um, the, the risk of civil attacks, so the risk of people creating in open, decentralized, and anonymous or pseudonymous networks. It's free for people to create many multiple identities and take part in governance. And this is actually one of the reasons why DAOs have um, models of governance that ask you to hold some capital to prove that you're an actual person and to uh, give you a specific weight in the governance of, um, of a protocol. Now, that being said, uh, Web3 is often perceived as absolutely synonymous with decentralization. And yet, the most recent research is pointing out that DAOs are no one near as decentralized as we like them as we would like them to be, right? They most of the time tend to be very centralized around the few whales, so the few users that have a lot of money, that hold a lot of tokens. And today we've talked a lot about how can we use blockchain and refi to empower local communities, small farmers to really have a say in the in the global supply chain, to have a fair distribution of value. So the question is 
since di digital identity or the lack of digital identity is the original sin for all, all of this proof of stake uh, governance that creates some new disbalances, is it, uh, is it really what's going to crack the case for a true decentralized and more horizontal, or more democratic governance, do you think? Like, is better digital identity the condition for the refi projects that we've talked about to successfully empower local communities? Perhaps Duke, since you're the one who gave that example, you want to bounce, you know, uh, on I mean, this. Yeah, I mean, governance, uh, it's, it's one of the most uh, important topics that we have uh, as we're moving into uh, self-organizing uh, in groups. There's only so much that we can do individually. And the idea of DAOs uh, really captured the uh, public imagination. I mean, just, just the, the acronym itself as the, as the DAO, it's, it's a, it's a tr truly a beautiful thing. Almost as beautiful as the legend of Satoshi, the anonymous, you know, found. Like, it's, it's just uh, um, mythologically uh, amazing. Um, but, uh, I mean, as far as governance, being able to buy your way into uh, being able to then make essentially any sort of uh, decision, um, is problematic. Uh, like in the United States, we have uh, lobbying, uh, which is has similar problems, and we're kind of seeing some of the results in you know the way. But you know, I don't want to get too political. Uh, <laughs> but um, that's fine. We're in the former city hall, so it's <laughs> not a bad place to be all a bit political. <laughs> um, but but yeah, like like. Uh, like some of these methodologies that we're talking about of um, like de-duping identities, like guarding against the Sybil attacks, you know, it's really required to be able to have this kind of ideal of, of having your voting power spread equally amongst uh, the populace, you know, in some way, shape or form. Um, and then how that's accomplished really can go all the way from something that is a bit totalitarian and, you know, surveillance style um, to something that is reputational in the group that you're in. Uh, that all it requires is uh, self-attesting uh, to the others in the group and, um, uh, you know, and then some, some clever algorithms around that. And it you know, goes all the way back to uh, Phil Zimmerman and the early PGP uh, Web of Trust, which is, you know, uh, I doubt anyone here has been to a key signing party. Uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> to respond to that. So, DAOs are fun. I like DAOs. I have co founded a couple DAOs. I advise a DAO. And I call them dinos. They are DAOs in name only. They are not decentralized. They are not autonomous. Sometimes, but not always, are they especially organized. DAOs, largely, are based on people who only know each other's wallet addresses. That means that the only thing I know about you is your wallet address. The only thing I know is how many tokens are mapped to it. I don't know what time zone you're in, what language you speak, how you identify as a person. All I know is how much money you have. So together, when we pool our addresses, we can be a group chat with a bank account. We can govern ourselves like a plutocracy. That's literally it. We built plutocratic group chats with bank accounts and we called it the future of work. The switching costs of moving from one DAO to another are extraordinarily high because you cannot bring proof of your non-financial labor, proof that you organized the call, you threw the pizza party, you got the hats, whatever those tasks might be. And so the switching costs are extraordinarily high from DAO to DAO. Because DAOs are only able to emit or communicate financially, there is no way to recognize or acknowledge labor that is non-financial. Um, this creates a challenge, right, where um, you have the ability to market buy your way in to make calls if that DAO does not otherwise make, you know, additional requirements. You've had to hold the tokens for this long or, or you know, other sorts of behaviors. Another challenge with DAOs is that even when we talk about plutocratic voting, check the turnout on Snapshot. 
I challenge you to find me a DAO that has 80% plus voter turnout for more than half of the proposals that they have. Most people who are active and excited about DAOs don't actually vote in their own local communities. There's a lot of really interesting survey data about that. So this fetish of governance, this idea of governance, um, really doesn't play out when we are invited to actually participate. I think one of the challenges of the idea of the DAO is this expectation of shared financial gain based on speculation. One of the reasons that civil resistance is such an issue today is because we lured the dragon out of the cave. We raised it to, to feast on tokens. And so now the civil monster is a problem because everyone assumes that when you get a wallet and do stuff on chain, you should expect an airdrop. So when we create a market of access around a single identifier or a simple set of behaviors to invite an airdrop, we create a bot problem. So whether it's distribution of UBI enabled by AI or handling airdrop farming, we talk about civil resistance because we created this problem ourselves due to a focus of sale on block space. Well, of course, uh, blockchain um is about governance too, but uh, as you said, not many people feel not many people feel involved, and and this is a, another question to know if there are real people around or not. So what I can just to to give you an example, what we did uh, in the European uh, Blockchain uh, Partnership, uh, we, we together with the European Commission, we co-organized uh, different uh, groups. Uh, there is a policy group, and then you have the technical group, and you have a small group that is called <laughs> the the policy task force, and the technical um, uh, governance. And the technical governance is really very interesting. Of course, it's not a huge blockchain uh, led by communities. It's uh, state members, 27. And uh, they have uh, each of them uh, will have uh, uh, around three to five nodes. And uh, there is uh, this rule that have been created and that are confidential. I will not... Uh, <laughs> say exactly how it works, but it was really very well thought with every every possible uh, features in mind and uh, possible cyber attacks and uh, how is it if the nodes get lost, uh, how should uh, the other uh, share the nodes. So you see the governance of the of a state blockchain is also very interesting. And the other thing with uh, my little example of my university is that there are at least 500 uh, public uh, universities uh, within Europe, I would say uh, more than 1,000 with the private uh, higher education system. And in the end, uh, they all have the same kind of data for a diploma, but it's so cool to think that they will all be able to issue in a common platform. And this is really innovative because it has never been done before that uh, people s work on our learning outcomes. And it's really about human capital. So on the one hand, there is this governance with state members that has been well thought of and that is reflected technically. And on the other hand, it's a huge governance of thousands of stakeholders that will have to work together, use the same standards as an envelope to send data. And I think this is really uh, interesting too. Yeah, well, I mean, the issue of bringing everyone around the same standard is definitely something that needs to be addressed here, right? Um, it, it, digital identity as a value proposition, like, as a use case for blockchain technology is not something new, right? Like, we've been talking about it for years and years and years pretty much every like pretty much ever since blockchain technology became quite mainstream right and um, I'm thinking about an example in 2016 there was a coalition of private and public actors that decided to fund uh, a project that was called ID 2020 so in 2016 they thought that in 2020 they would have a digital identity system that would enable every single human being on Earth to have a digital identity system. Spoiler alert, we're in 2023, and it didn't work. 
but I mean, the project is still active, so perhaps something will come out of it. Uh, my question to you then, as you are all working on separate technological stacks and on your own standards or implementation of standards, like, what is there to learn in those mistakes of the past, and how do we make it actually happen? Like, what's so hard about it, and, and how can we move past those hardships? Uh, and perhaps this one, Perrin, perhaps you want to go first, since the, you, you work for, as you say, like the DNA of the framework that you're working for is to try to build services that are shared across nearly 30 countries. Mm. Right? It's the very identity of the European blockchain service infrastructure. Um, first, there is also a, a regulation on identity and digital identity in, in the European Union that is called EIDAS. And uh, they, are, they have been working uh, in the last three years uh, on uh, the way to reinvent uh, identity. And of course, uh, you can't force any state member, it's a frame. Uh, but uh, the distributed ledger have been included uh, in, in this frame. And of course, uh, beyond uh, this, uh, this world's distributed ledger, it's, it's uh, EBSI. So it's the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure that is meant. Um, so th this, this, of course, is supposed to change in the coming years, but I would give 10 years at least, you know, uh, because it's a regulatory and technical innovation that needs to be developed, uh, upscale, uh, come down to people, and that they understand that, that it rebuilds trust upon the data that uh, they really control. So, of course, I know it's a long-term project. Nobody can say within three years I will change the world, the, the world and the way Google, uh, Google and Apple works and retake the control over my data. So I would say um, in any case, it's, it's a long way to go. But interestingly, in your view, it's a very top-down process, right? Like it needs coordination from the top, from nation states to agree on a common set of regulations. And you know what? People have to be, feel concerned in the administration too. It's not only top down, it's uh, we are <laughs> the people. <laughs> we need to express, uh, and I think this is the wish of many people, but they don't know how to begin with. Uh, so let's uh, not try to, to, as you said, uh, to, to think that uh, it, everyone will come to crypto, but in the end, if it's the governance is good if they see a difference in the way they are notified or the way they accept to share the data. Um, I think the trust will come at some point. Wait, sorry, can you repeat yeah. the question one more time? Oh, yeah. So the question was, why is that, uh, that, like, why is that, that we have not achieved that decentralized identity yet well we've been working on it for a couple of years and ah. and, and, and we perceived it as something straightforward rather easy pretty you know pretty obvious use case of blockchain applications and what can we learn from it to make it happen well you show me the incentives and i'll show you the outcome we financially incentivized Ponzi's and yield farms, and so we had 800 of those, and we're still using Eventbrite and Luma and Partyful for crypto events, right? We did not economically incentivize the ability to create verifiable data about addresses because the only data we wanted to map to those addresses was purely speculative and financial from venture markets investing in such capabilities to retail investors excited to, in the United States, use their you know, um, stimulus checks or you know, airdrop money to participate, to the sheer delight of a global financial system that allowed us to get outsized gain for a small amount of input if we were early. Part of the reason we do not have an identity system is that adds friction to the liquidity of financial capital. It fractures liquidity to limit 
the wallets to which a token can freely flow. It breaks up the onboarding process to require things like KYC, and it also forces a level of compliance in otherwise Wild West cowboyish non-compliant systems or explicitly extra legal systems. So at first, we cannot be surprised that identity hasn't landed. We have actively funded non-identity things and things that benefit from not having identity. Beyond that, when we think about you know, what level of standardization is required here, in Web3, we're really terrible at history. Every three years, I kind of joke that you know, every few years with the Bitcoin happening, someone proposes NFT passports again. <laughs> someone is going to propose supply chains with just NFTs going from wallet to wallet again. These are ideas that, you know, someone's going to propose on-chain social recovery again. We know these things don't scale. There's plenty of data, plenty, you know, you know, plenty of graveyards of dead projects, good money after bad, illustrating that these, these projects do not necessarily work in those ways. We are not great at communicating what we have learned in earlier cycles and making that knowledge readily accessible to others. Furthermore, the sale of block space means that we now have a war of layer twos, a war of chains, where each is trying to win victoriously over the others to make their block space more desirable to developers, to anchor data to their chain so that we will end up with another, another set of silos, but this time the backends are public instead of private. So when we look at the incentive systems that we have right now, and then we look at the request for an identity controlled by us as subjects, decoupled from execution layers that moves from chain to chain, we have an impasse. We have an impasse of incentives, an impasse of standards. And lastly, when I think about the data standards themselves, the concept of a verifiable credential almost like a blockchain unto itself, containing its provenance, context, and timestamp, you know, those have been, like you were saying, around for, you know, a better part of, of more than a decade. Yeah, a couple, couple decades. Um, it's kind of wild, actually. Last year, I had the opportunity to have an hour-long debate with Vitalik Buterin, the author of the Ethereum paper, over the concept of verifiable credentials and uh, non-transferable NFTs, and he actually wasn't familiar with how those primitives worked. So even though this data is available, even though it's freely available, the leaders of the crypto ecosystem are not, will, or, you know, are not in a position to you know, appreciate, engage with the long, boring, difficult to read, complex to implement, esoteric standards. And the last thing that I will say here is that usage turns specs into standards. It doesn't matter how elegant your hypothetical idea is if the switching costs to adopt it are so high that no one is willing to do so. And that's why we are seeing inferior solutions being adopted because the cost of switching to them is that much lower and the incentive system to adopt that suboptimal solution pays off in a shorter term. Yeah. I. Uh no, um, and due to wrap up, I mean, <laughs> yeah, the um, the I, you know specifically, I did 2020. It's uh, there's just so much wrong with it. It's <laughs> like it's even it's in it's even in the mission statement, right? Which was um, to provide uh, unique uh, identity to you know everyone in the world, and um, so first of all, I mean, it's just top down by the way, by the language that they're using. We're going to provide you with this thing. And it's going to be unique. And we'll make sure that it's unique. Now, so let's take, uh, uh, I think in the original, um, uh, what I read, it mentioned the Global South. And like, so if we take like Latin America, um, you know, Central and South America, there's, they have gone through 80 years of being ravaged um, from everything from puppet governments to, you know, large IMF loans as an excuse to transfer uh, resources from the state to foreign corporations. Um, and then uh, a really nice group of foreigners comes and says, we're going to provide you with these unique IDs. And, you know, maybe we'll need a biometric or something. It's going to be good for you. It's, it's, it's going to help you. And, well, yeah, how did that work out last time? You know, my mother told me never to, you know, it's like... Um, I think uh, there's a lot of distrust of uh, top-down uh, solutioning. And, and then also we run the risk of this kind of um, uh, well-intentioned uh, but uh, kind of disguised neo-colonialism, like going into a place without fully understanding what's going on there and um, uh, overlaying a, a solution 
that is from our model of what's actually happening when uh, cultural differences are, it's not something that you can actually project. Like, cultures truly are very different. Um, if you've ever traveled through rural China, you, you'll really get a sense for it. Um, can I? Uh, I mean, if you want to, to jump in, go ahead. I, we're going to. Uh, no, just uh, so, so this is recorded, so, so if you would like to be in the recording, speaking in the microphone will help. Okay. I just wanted to add a comment to what you were saying because you just you brought up a word, neo-colonialism. So in Vancouver, where I'm from, we have two projects. And what it is is that we've given these two communities, we've given, actually the communities have found a way to establish their own uh, technical illiteracy around them. Um, First, it's our indigenous communities, our Coast Salish people. So they specifically, they have designed um, with blockchain technology, digital identification that allows for them to access language services and be able to provide for themselves in their own way that they've established governance around their DAO that they've developed um, and help their youth and, and further communities connect to their ancient languages. And then the second group that the government of BC works closely with is our homeless and, sorry, our individuals facing housing crisis in our downtown east side. And by providing them information about blockchain technology and such, we've had a few organizations organize together and implement digital ID for people suffering on the streets. And why that's important for them is because often people who face housing crisis, you know, their IDs get washed up from weather, stolen, whatever it might be, and they actually do not have access to medical attention the way that they need to. Canada has a huge overdose crisis, um, especially in BC, that they face. So I wanted to say that, I, I, first I want to say thank you all for showing up and sharing as much as you have, like the goods and the bads and the ins and outs of it, but I think when like the technology, like the big point that has not been really brought up, at least maybe I've, I've missed it, is just the fact that it's something alternative to what's existing. And the trust is built within the communities themselves. So if you've given them the technology and you've allowed them to understand it, they can build what's needed for them rather than us coming in and telling them how to do things. Of course, we can tap into the communities and we can learn more about them and find out more when we actually talk one-on-one -on -one with the individuals. Um, but I've seen it work incredibly, especially the digital ID aspect of it. Like, and it's not, of course, we, there are some, you know, gaps when it comes to, like, the security and such, the KYC that exists beyond it, but where else would they go? Indigenous groups in, in BC specifically have a hard time, especially when they're living on reservation or reserves, um, accessing loans. So having this sort of, like, community-established technology, they're able to tap into DeFi, alternative loans, microfinancing, things that really benefit them. So. But, uh, so I think just to, to refine the point a little bit, um, the, the kind of difference between providing uh, your subjects basically with an uh, uh, identity and then the other side is actually providing the tools to then provide yourself with the identity in a, in a sovereign fashion. And, and that actually maintains uh, dignity and culture um, you know, at the same time as, as enabling access to this digital world that requires an a incredible amount of expertise to actually learn about and create on, so much so that even though, what, 75% in the US at least, 75% of people are very concerned or extremely concerned about privacy, only 3% have made any action that, that, you know, to guard or safeguard their digital privacy. It's difficult and it's beyond the, beyond the scope of most people's lives. Um, but that's, that's beautiful. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, thank you very much for this wonderful testimonial. 
Just before, I think we're just going to open the floor for questions instead of having the full uh, reverse format. And thank you very much. So, so feel free, if you have a story to contribute or question, feel free to do that. And while you think about it, uh, I, 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 I thank you for not ending on a very grim note, right? Because we were doing this, this very healthy and necessary self-critique work that has not been done enough in the Web3 space, I feel like. Uh, but I would like uh, each of you, a little bit like you did presenting one of your one of the projects you're working on. Like, like what for you is the next uh, positive impact that digital identity, decentralized identity, is going to bring uh, in the coming years? Like, like what do you think? Uh, what are you working on? What kind of projects are you even currently working on that are already making a change with decentralized identity? So Duke, you've already. You, you, <laughs> We've already talked about the downsides quite a lot. So, so let's yes. try to fit so it. let's talk about all of the fun that is to come. Exactly. Um, so, from an so no, no, that's great. No, this is it is valuable and important for us to understand the environment in which we build, and that is always also why at Disco we bring the party. So at Disco, we believe that you are the multifaceted center of the party, just like this Disco ball. You have many facets: your Ethereum address, your Bitcoin address, your email address, but you're the same person who shows up to every single one of them. You just reflect your identity differently depending on which one you use. So at Disco, our platform makes it easy for you to carry around data written about you in the form of verifiable credentials. Our web app is called the Data Backpack. Just like you can take your real wallet, put it into your physical backpack, and carry all the stuff that you need for your adventures, similarly, you can control your on-chain financial assets, off-chain credentials from your preferred pronouns and primary language to your educational achievements, memberships, or even private friends lists. Carry that around with you from one app to another so that you never have to fill out a form again so that you can show up in any digital or physical environment and enjoy a personalized experience based on the parts of yourself that you choose to share. So if you want to check out what it's like to be able to use your keys to send and receive different kinds of digital assets that require no gas, that can be used across chains, that can be used for access control to smart contracts, Google Docs, e-commerce discounts, Telegram chats, Discord channels, physical spaces, and more, app.disco.xyz, encourage everybody to come check it out. If you want to get your very first credential, you can also come visit me. I will happily send you a quick link, and in one click, you can experience what it's like, similar to these students, to be able to take custody of a credential that represents your personal achievement, and to allow anyone, anywhere, to be able to validate it, to be able to determine its contents. Um, so what we're particularly excited about this week, um, we've announced an integration with Lens, we've dropped our integration with ENS, we have an integration Alpha Leak tomorrow with Spotify. So you'll be able to take custody of your top artists, your top songs of late. We're integrating next week. Um, we'll, we'll have our GitHub popularity score, so you can integrate your GitHub and see where you stack up in terms of your influence to other developers. Um, also excited to be collaborating with our friends at Gitcoin Passport, allowing you to take custody of a score of your proof of personhood and many, many more integrations. So if you're a builder, you're interested in identity, you're a non-technical leader of a community, you want to drop uh, membership credentials or proofs of work or recognition um, to your squad, please come talk to me. Would love to support you all. Um, and thank you again so much to our, our host for having us. Well, thank you. And Perrine. Uh, oh, well, I mean. And, uh, this was worthy of an applause. Uh, Perrine. As you may have understood, uh, I don't work with communities. I'm not so much involved in DAO. I am not so much involved in the AO or, or way of voting uh, as of today, <laughs> new ways of voting, etc. However, I love that story. It was the very first uh, ex-student to have received uh, his uh, diploma. And before blockchain, nobody thought of the public transformation and digitization of the diploma. But you work hard for three years, four years, five years. And actually, in the end, uh, a paper comes six months after you have worked so hard and have your results. And this uh, very first student was uh, telling us on the social networks that he was so happy to have his diploma was from Djibouti. And uh, so I, I called him, and this was already for Blockchain for Good. I asked him to tell us why it was so good uh, that he had to express it. And he said, well, 
I went back to Djibouti with a PDF telling I had my exam, but it was not the diploma. So nobody wanted this, you know. He was working six months there, six months there. So he always had to show this, and people were not satisfied with a PDF because this isn't trust. You know, everyone can change it, etc. So finally, he knew that his diploma has arrived in Lille, in the north of France. So he had to send an, a paper envelope. In the paper envelope, another paper envelope. And on that, a, a French attempts to send him an original, the original copy. And finally, he got it. And uh, people didn't want to, uh, they wanted to have a certified copy at the French embassy of Djibouti. So it was all very complicated and long. And finally, this, uh, as of today, it's a link, and, and then the data are, are stamped, uh, thanks to uh, the, the software solution we use uh, with uh, BC Diploma, our partner. And, uh, and, and then he went, he went to his chef, uh, and he said, uh, look, I have a blockchain diploma. And you know what? It worked. It, they trusted the blockchain diploma because in Wikipedia, which is a peer-to-peer -peer <laughs> uh, knowledge uh, source, you know, they saw that blockchain was about authenticity in the web. And so this is interesting because trust is not only the electronic solution that, of course, we want to arrive there, you know, and have verifiable credentials very easily to sort out that is easy to use for anyone. And this is the digital identity I want, you know, that it's an app, easy to... But in the end, the, his director trusted this new blockchain uh, certificate because it was said that it was a new way to authenticate documents in the blockchain, to notarize. And so I, I, I like that idea that um, the trust is already imposing itself, you know, <laughs> before the technology is completely ready. I don't speak about the crypto monies, huh? I speak about other ways to use, uh, uh, take the opportunities of, uh, of these new technologies. And, and so finally, when, when I began with uh, working on that subject, I was asked to review the white book of the MIT Media Lab, the, of the Digital Credential Consortium. And I met Kim Hamilton Duffy at that, uh, that stage, and, and it was uh, really great. And they said, we want to reinvent the diploma. It should not be a dead paper. You know? It should be something full with interesting data. So for example, we translate it into English. This is what took the most of the time, you know? because you have to ask each professor how he translates his discipline <laughs> into English, etc. So it was really a hard work for 38 people, different people in, in my university, and this is what I'm proud of. Duke, uh, your turn of t sharing us one, one story, one project that is worthy of applause. No, I'll try to keep it to one. Sensitive. Yeah. There you go. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So, in uh, in my last project, we were uh, working on a, a true uh, mutual credit system uh, to enable a barter network uh, among businesses that didn't look like barter. It just looked like they were transacting with something that was denominated in dollars. And we had behind the scenes a centralized component extremely centralized. We had to assign a credit line to every business who came on. And so most of the arc of that startup was figuring out how to properly decentralize it. And they, they did really some wonderful, wonderful financial modeling using you know, the existing kind of assumptions from the existing financial system. But the real answer is true reputation. And we couldn't build that because of the way you have to hyper-focus as a startup and only solve one thing and the funding and the pressures and all this. Um, however, uh, that's what something like the identity system actually enables. Like these activities, all they require are to be able to self-attest and publish the attestation in some kind of a verifiable data registry. And if it's architected correctly, 
it can be completely interoperable. There's no reason why it's stuck on a particular blockchain or somebody's server or you know any of that. Um, and then and you know and the way we put them together, the way that we um, parse out what that is and, and arrive at a uh, let's say a universal. Somebody wants a universal credit score. Someone else wants actually a perspectival idea of a particular value attribute. Like you can re parse the original information. And then with the selective disclosure, you can actually um, let it be private until you don't want it to be private. So this is, you know, I'm, I'm speaking with the um, uh, a Desai uh, fellow who uh, just won Giant Lab. He's just not a good marketer. Um, but he wants to be able to do research. And his institution won't let him. Every step of the way, is layers and layers of permission. And then by the time he got through that, they're like, no, it's too far out of the norm. You, you can't do research on that. And, um, and so with this kind of a system, uh, he wants to create a kind of universal decentralized network for citizen science and you know, anon science. And with you know, something like you know, these sorts of attestations and zero knowledge proofs, we can actually have paper reviews by someone who you know is an expert in the field without them having to risk their reputation on something that's maybe outside of what their university or institution considers mainstream. Um, so it's, it's really exciting times. Um, yeah, so thank you. Identikey.me, it will be up in a few weeks. Thank you. I'll tell your friends I feel him. All right. Uh, Moving on, and uh, we we have something about like, like something like ten minutes. So I hope you all had the time to think about a good question or a good comment or a good story to share as well. Feel free to <laughs> feel free to raise your hand over there. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Um, so I understand that nowadays one of the most difficult things is how you uh, recover your keepers, uh, but your private key actually if you lose it. So you have your, your nowadays like even to do a, a money transaction, you are like scared or uncomfortable. Then when it's about your identity, if you lose that, then it's going to be uh, yeah very hard. So question is. Taking that into account, what would be your best bet? Uh, I understand that, yeah, just your, your idea. Maybe in five or 10 or even 15 years, where uh, we can really solve that, uh, like what would be the, the path that is going to, to, uh, to take us uh, there when we don't have to uh, care about it? Like it would be more educational, Educational, it would be more the government uh, paving the way, or it could be maybe a technolo technological advance like, I know, like, like Warcoin, taking the, the iris scan maybe when you are born and then like you're, it's there or somewhere forever. I don't know, again, like best bet. Um, yeah, open question. Thank you for asking a question that was, in, that was featured in my uh, questions, but I decided to cut. So thank you very much for bringing, back to, bring it, bringing it back to life. All right, social recovery moment. Um, so you all may remember back to DevCon 2 when uh, some you know, teammates, former teammates of, of mine from a company called Consensus then called Uport came up with this idea of on-chain social recovery. The suggestion is that you would delegate other addresses, publish those on chain, and then when you lost your keys, you could get some assistance getting back in. Now that didn't work very well because your delegates, the people who were going to help you get back into your wallet, well their addresses were publicly on chain and they could find each other. So they could just decide to lock you out of your wallet anytime they felt like. Probably not so great. Also it's kind of weird to ask your friend to pay to get you back into your own wallet. 
And that's what has to happen when your delegates have to process an on-chain transaction in order to recover or rotate those keys for you. So collusion and the fact that your homies are paying for you to get back into your own stuff made it pretty complicated. Um, so actually, we've seen even solutions like Argent, for example, that initially leveraged this are moving away from this model. There's plenty of academic research that is, illustrates that basic social recovery doesn't scale. I think one of the best solutions of social recovery that we've seen implemented thus far is actually with Apple. Their quote unquote social recovery mechanism with two delegates is basically just the same thing as their regular customer service. They're just getting your mom in the queue before you have to talk to a customer service representative. So it uses the existing trust models that we have today. The backstop is still the enterprise and their ability to you know, master the, the security and keys of that system. And realistically, that's what we're going to deal with forever. The idea of completely self-recovered, self-sovereign identity means that like, you would then have to have some kind of, I don't know, like self, I, I don't know, it, it, would, it would prohibit you from being able to receive signed government from, or signed, signed government data, for example, as a way to attest to your identity, which is often, as we discussed here, one of those major elements. Now, I've heard a lot of, of spicy takes about biometrics, oh my god, you know, my eyeballs, this, that. Um, you know, everybody knows that a single basic biometric is subject to collision. Anyone who's, you know, talking about, oh, WorldCoin, they're going to, you know, stealing my eyeballs to concentrate, you know, this identity, like, they don't understand what WorldCoin is doing. Um, be, being able to incorporate a biometric into a per proof of personhood protocol that incorporates multiple sources of data, multiple expressions of data from social interaction to the accelerometer on your device, the pace of your walk, the timbre of your voice, the cadence of your typing on the keys. We have so many different patterns of expression and data that we can put together to demonstrate that we are who we say we are. Um, so whether that is the embodiment of a specific individual, my disparity or local difference from another, um, really kind of what this all comes down to is what is the data in our identity that we're carrying around? If we lose access to it, where do we have to go back to to ask for another copy? And so when it comes to that recovery mechanism, the sort of question that you initially asked, I actually think that we're in a pretty good position once we embrace account abstraction technologies, once we enable um, individuals to not depend on a single EOA that cannot be rotated, but rather we embrace technologies like decentralized identifiers that allow us to rotate keys while maintaining a persistent public identifier and associating other service and messaging endpoints. Um, but I think it is going to get a little messier before it gets better with social recovery because the entire ecosystem is actually not on the same page in terms of what scales and what doesn't. And so even though we do have a lot of research to illustrate what we know to be true. Um, I think we are still, yet again, going to observe people to try to do the impossible and then for us to learn that way with some, some bumps and bruises. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, obviously near, near to my heart. Like, how do you, how do you make sure that uh, we retain access to our keys? Um, you know, as uh, not all of us have pr absolutely perfect infosec and you know as it goes to uh, the general populace that's going to be um, more and more true uh, so yeah so even like yeah utilizing um, sort of a blockchain agnostic account abstraction like with a multi-party computation you can have like a set of authoritative nodes that you would you know authenticate with that can like give you your key back um, that is a trade-off in terms of security. And so there should be a lot like set of gradations uh, of security that allows you to have ultimate, I am my own bank, no one can get it unless they, you know, break this brick and find my metal words, you know, all the way to, um, yeah, I'm using the serial number on this dollar bill. and. Uh, you know, that, that's a capability token and, you know, I'm trusting this service to, to do a signature on my behalf. Like, there's, there's, a, there's a level of gradation for what the actual use case is because when it comes down to it, this is about people. It's about coordination. And um, even, even given the best possible uh, recovery system, you're never always going to be able to recover it. And that shouldn't be the end of the world. So what gives the key its meaning? At the end of the day, it's some authoritative attestation. Like some authority says, I 
uh, attest that this key has this particular meaning. It could be from me to you. I'm the authority on you know, my colleague you know, who I have worked with for years and his programming ability. Or it could be a government. I've uh, verified this person's uh, picture ID and they have said that this is the, the key that they have access to and so now it's associated. Because it's based on an authority, uh, revocation and uh, rotation is built into that. Uh, so with effort, it should take some effort, um, hopefully not as much as, as getting a, um, you know, a, a first copy of a diploma from the, you know, mailed from the government. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, with some effort, you should be able to do a rotation uh, of what is pointing at that key. Um, and, and so, yeah. Well, just before I thank you, I, I would like uh, Perrine, perhaps, yeah, you, you have some last uh, few I words to add? It's about sustainability of all those data and who will decide what we keep. You said forever, but it's not forever. Silicium gets old. Uh, th th there are possibilities with the DNA that uh, would uh, carry out forever, for <laughs> forever practically. Uh, Lots of data. It's it's really we we can't separate all all what we are doing uh, of the question of of the the sustainability and the co the the cost the cost for the for, you know for the climate and the the matière première. I don't even know how to say in English matière première. The primary resources, primary yeah. materials. Yeah. Ma materials. Used. So this was just a, a small thing to say. I like the idea of keeping things on ourselves, but I find it very intrusive <laughs> and difficult. All right. Well, <laughs> on those beautiful, very philosophical notes, I mean, we've had quite a travel during this uh, conversation. I'd like to